Technicians of Spaceship Earth, welcome to Hawk Binge and do not adjust your receivers. Our controls are firmly set on the heart of Season 2. Matt's finger is hovering above the publish button for the Levitation episode, but before we go there, we wanted to take a look back at what made the 1970s so special and examine those tracks that Matt selected from each album to make it onto our master playlist. And we want to do that by re-listening to our reactions to the tracks that made it onto that playlist so far. Now, if you've been on a recent Hawk Binge binge, then you might skip this one. But for the rest of us, we're heading back to 1970 and the eponymous album from Hawkwind. While Matt's praise for that album was not exactly glowing, the extended jam of seeing it as you really are was able to melt his stony heart. Seeing it as you really are is for me a little bit of a return to form, especially again on my first listen. I was thinking that the return to theatrical sound design is nice. I feel like, again, it's another long atmospheric intro, so I guess like they're doing this an awful lot. Not that I mind it at this point because I feel like this is building to something where I feel like the paranoias kind of are doing it for doing its sake. But this one makes you a little bit more pensive. It adds a little bit more interest to it because you know it's going to break into an actual track. I know this is a technical gripe, but the fact that they hard pan the guitar solo into the right speaker made it very hard for me to hear the mix because the very first time I listened to this, I was listening to it on headphones and I just have an old DJ habit where I tend to listen to music, one headphone on my ear and one headphone off my other ear so I can listen to the room. And I thought that this track really wasn't going anywhere for a long time before I switched ears and then realised that there was a whole guitar solo I'd missed and I had to listen to the track all over again. So. It's one of those things where maybe in the 70s it was more of a thing. I know that stereo was still pretty fresh in the 70s. I remember my dad telling me how a um, whole lot of love blew his mind when it was on stereo. But the fact this is so hard panned, it makes it a little bit more annoying than anything. But again, I'm not really going to beat up on it that much because it's the 70s. Again, I think this is something that I only really experience when streaming this track, basically, and therefore listening to it over headphones. I basically been playing it as I say on vinyl through the hi-fi so I hadn't really experienced that hard panning and yes I find it quite annoying the hard panning I have a box set reissued Beatles albums and the first few of those do the same thing and the track will start with the drums just in one ear and I'm instantly wondering if I've lost the bluetooth connection in the other headphone and then the bass kicks in in the other ear and yeah I think I would prefer not to have the hard panning I think now in an era when you have people doing 5.1 Dolby remixes and now Atmos remixes you become used to hearing different sounds in a spectrum but there I think a lot of care is taken in where they are in the space and how they move and how it's done with a lot of subtlety and a lot of nuance when it's uh, you know a four or five piece band and one whole instrument is just in one ear only i find that quite tricky although the guitar solo itself is really good uh, mm. it's hugh lloyd langton who as i say goes on to do a lot of amazing things with hawkwind about 10 years down the line after this but yeah i find the hard panning a distraction and i prefer to listen to it over the speakers in the room so that it blends better to me agreed even so just to carry on with the production conversation a little bit longer is that I actually like this track. I like that it brings in so many brass instruments. It has an almost Sergeant Peppery vibe for me. It feels a bit more fantastical. Again, it feels a bit more interesting. But for me, all the things they do to this track exacerbates the feeling that it wasn't recorded amazingly well. It does feel like it was recorded in a garage or something with very few microphones, one of them a lot closer to the drum kit than I was expecting. And it, the sound, even with the digital remaster that I was listening to online, was quite muddy and the sounds aren't as separated in the mix as much as I thought they would. So the whole thing feels a little bit more soupy than I was expecting. And I feel like I can, I can pick stuff out and it's not a deal breaker at that point. I was just more surprised, which again adds to this fact that it feels like a live album more than a studio album like if you'd have told me this was a bootleg of an album that they played live i would be ready to believe you 100 percent. yeah it's pretty astute because it's not it's not far wrong uh, it wasn't uncommon at that point for bands particularly making their early albums to go into the studio and basically play their live set in the studio and have it recorded and that's definitely what happens here 
Black Sabbath did the same thing with their first album. It was recorded in like two days because the producer had seen them live and just wanted to recreate that. And there are very few overdubs and very little production done. I get that impression that that's happening here as well. And I actually quite like that garage that DIY feel to this. It resonates for me because this is definitely a band being very progressive and experimenting but learning all the time. Other bands who became like the prog giants, a Yes, King Crimson, Pink Floyd, or Early Genesis, the bands that you really think of as these kind of prog giants, were full of virtuoso musicians, absolutely brilliant musicians, you know, keyboard wizards, genius guitarists, incredible drummers, playing in different time signatures, all limbs doing different things at the same time. And there's a lot of technicality, whereas to me, this is more a lot of feel and a lot of atmosphere and people experimenting and learning about what they're doing and just recording the results of that straight to the album and learning as they go. And I find that kind of attractive. I think it's also why Hawkwind were not really lumped in with those kind of music giants when punk hit. And it was, you know, down with Pink Floyd and down with Yes and all this kind of thing. There was no adverse reaction to Hawkwind at that point. I think because of this almost punk ethos, the DIY nature of putting all this together with a lack of these kind of classically trained virtuoso musicians. I think that's a signature part of the sound and they get definitely get better at that as these studio recordings take place over the next few years. While the first album was hard work for me, In Search of Space was filled with tracks that made me realise that Andy might just be onto something after all. You Know You're Only Dreaming really introduced me to the possibilities of spacey psychedelic jams. It's a strong one to start with, and it goes into something now in a very different mood uh, when we get to You Know You're Only Dreaming. Which for me feels very, like, proto desert fest psych just in terms of the vocal tones this for me is probably their most vocally sophisticated song i feel like a lot of their other lyrics and singing isn't always as in tune as it could be but this feels very considered it has a nice like lilt to it i feel like it's actually being sung for me it's just super catchy I like the You're Only Dreaming repetitive line is really nice. I love the jam it just breaks down into. This for me is where I thought Space Rock might go. It's kind of where I hoped it would go. And while the rest of the tracks make me feel that's not necessarily where it is all the time, I like the fact it can still get here. And I hope that there's a bit more of that in the future. I really like the fact that the drummer taps out the quarter beats on the cymbal. It helps you ground the track. Just having that little tink, 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 tink. Interestingly enough, it's also why I like certain techno records because they can get very growly and, and bassy and mumbly in terms of a lot of their, their sound palette. But you normally have a hi-hat or something which is just tick, 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 ticking away. And it's just amazing for me just to help just ground myself when I listen. So it's just interesting to draw a parallel there between uh, very dark techno and this 70s psyche stuff. I like that there's lots of delay that just creates this nice atmospheric bed. It might be why I like the North Americans and why I added that to the playlist. It's the same kind of feeling where the the notes start to just smear into a whole other experience, which it just then rests on nicely. It creates a nice foundation. I'd have liked to have a return to the chorus at some point because I like it so much, but I just listen to the track twice and then I'm happy. So (laughs) that's fair. (laughs) For me, for me as well, it even ends well which again is something that I'm still dinging Hawkwind a lot with, but this one finishes not in a kind of, oh, we're done with it. It actually feels like it just floats off and I'm left feeling like that just, you know, that kind of thing when you when you eat a good bit of food or you drink a bit of wine, that kind of finish. I have this kind of mental audio finish of this track where I feel like that's a nice clean, clean track and I'm I find myself smiling all the way through it. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, this is Dave Brock's strongest vocal. We've heard him sing two songs before. And this is the third kind of full vocal we hear from Dave and definitely is the strongest. It's funny, I I would never have picked that up if we weren't listening to these albums in sequence. Because if you don't listen to them in sequence, it's just another song that Dave sings. And he sings a lot of them. But yeah, it does definitely show some growth there. I really do like it. And it's, it's a really good mood change and a great closer for side one. In the first of what ended up being several specials, we turned our attention to that track. 
And despite it being under five minutes long, we managed to make a half hour podcast on it. Such is its impact on the band's legacy. So I can see why this became their hit. If there's any track that I've heard them play, this is much more catchy, much more mainstream feeling. Not necessarily in a, in a poppy kind of way, but just in a way where you can just see how it's been put together really nicely. Like you said, it has a solid groove through it. It has a lot of energy. It's, again, surprising to me, just given that we've just listened to In Search of Space. This almost feels like a Hurry on Sundown kind of track, not in its content, but just how different it is to the direction that it felt like they were pursuing, which now is interesting for me because I feel that every time I put on a new Hawkwind record, I have no idea what to expect. So the idea that they can just grab whatever they feel like and go, that's one of our records, is actually quite interesting. It was frustrating for a while, I think. I think maybe the OCD in me was was trying to pigeonhole them very early, but the fact that they're just doing stuff and mix people and ideas and energies is becoming more interesting to me. So the fact that they made this no longer surprises me. I can see why this was more of a hit than, say, Master of the Universe. I think Master of the Universe has a slightly more underground kind of vibe. It still rolls along. Somehow Silver Machine feels a bit more of the time. So I can see why it worked. It feels like a very vocal-led tune, like you said. I can't see this working unless you have the singer really take the lead of the track. You're right, let me really bring something to it that is that secret ingredient. And given that we now know how successful Lemmy and Motorhead are, it just feels like he's got that kind of golden touch that he can come into a band and just add this extra layer which catapults what they're doing into another stratosphere which makes them a chart success. So because it is something that I've heard before, it is a little bit more familiar, but I have been mainlining both the wrong and right versions of this for a week. And when you corrected me, I've only been listening to the right version for a day. And it's actually a lot nicer. Weirdly, comparing the two, it makes me realize how much I just prefer 70s rock compared to what the 80s does to that kind of music in the uh, in the near future. Yeah, it definitely has that rawness to it. And that's interesting because although Calvert wrote this, I don't think it could possibly have sounded like this either um, either in terms of the, the, the vocals or the music without Lemmy's particular brand of playing it, simply because at its heart, this is a pretty kind of heavy, bluesy rock and roll number. Um, and it almost makes me think that it's a, like a proto-motorhead track than it is Hawkwind in that respect. Protohead, I think, possibly, is a, is a term I've just come up with. How far is this before Motorhead appear? This, 72, Motorhead is, I think, 76. Okay, so there's a while before Lemmy really comes into his own. Absolutely, he's, and they don't really do anything quite like this again, uh, but there are definitely conversations that we'll have about that. He does have a, a big impact. That new rhythm section, I think, him with Simon King, is also really important, I think, in this track. It really does work. And it's funny, I came into us doing this bonus episode and I was pretty blasé about it. I'm so familiar with Silver Machine. I've heard it so often. Like, it's always the track that you will hear on radio or in compilations, a bit like Paranoid from Black Sabbath. It's just the one that people play or that people know. Um, And I've heard it so often, I wasn't going to bother to listen to it for this episode because I just know it so well. And my feelings about it were that I kind of like it, it's all right, but it probably wouldn't be in like a top 20 Hawkwind tracks I'd put together. Just that familiarity that I have with, I suppose. But then today I actually did put the headphones on and play it loud just to due diligence more than anything else. And I actually found myself smiling and really getting into it like I'd kind of reconnected with with an old friend, basically, and just picked up so many things in it that I really liked. Even at the end, whoever it is screaming, my machine in that <laughs> voice. I just yeah. basically, I just really liked it and played it four or five times over when I had no need to. I think to your point just there, the exuberance that this has, like that little person just shouting, sell a machine. I completely agree. And I think the, um, the difference between this and Master of the Universe, which I feel like is the track I compare it to just because of its 
similar construction and, and vibe is that Master of the Universe is very downy, which is where you get the kind of doomy bit. And the vocals are much more droney. You know, they don't have a huge amount of character where this one, all of the changes in the chords are up. Even the vocals, they start and, you know, the start of the word and the end of the word flick up. So it's always sounding like it's rising and rising. So it just has a very different energy. It has an exuberance to it, which the other tracks don't in the same way. They feel much more shoegazy and, and much more like introspective, where this one just feels like it's trying to burst out of itself. It's going to be interesting when we get to uh, Space Ritual, which is the live album that we'll do a bonus podcast for. You hear some of those tracks being played by this rhythm section and the impact that they have. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting one. One thing I was really impressed with was the fact they could get antiseptically clean as a lyric into a pop record or a record which ends up being popular. I thought that was quite impressive. Just antiseptically clean. Well, it's a five syllable word, which I don't feel you get much in pop music. But also I feel like just the phrase antiseptically clean hits different listening to it now in COVID. I feel like, yeah, I want to go there. (laughs) <laughs> yes, <they're... laughs> I want to go into the silver machine if it's antiseptic. That sounds very, very useful. 49 years ahead of their time, uh, for mm. sure, on that score. And irregardless of whether or not they say it's a motorbike or a car, I still feel that given the person who wrote the vocals, I feel like there's a spiritual connection, if not a production or energy connection to the logbook. I do feel that if you don't know that they're being silly, that you could assume that the silver machine could refer to the Hawkwind as it goes through time. You know, they are talking about time. They are talking about the other side of the sky. They're talking about zodiac signs, which again is a big thing in the logbook. So I do feel that, again, in terms of what connects it to Hawkwind, yep, the effects for sure, but also just the tone and the content, even though the energy and the production are very different, there's a nub of Hawkwind in there, which again makes you feel like it's a worthy addition to the band's discography. Yeah, very much so. It's um, definitely there's a a great language, I think, that Calvert has in the writing. Um, And it's interesting that this has kind of reappeared more recently for me in the live canon for Hawkwind. So when I was seeing them play in the 90s, I didn't hear this very often. There were a few occasions when Lemmy joined them on stage because they did continue to be mates even after he was fired. And he would join them on stage and play Silver Machine. It was always good fun. But recently they've played it a little bit more and they played a pretty good version of it on the 50th anniversary. There's something about that voice that hard to hear this song being sung by anybody else. In direct contrast to the rock jam of Silver Machine, Spaces Deep on the Do Re Mi Fa Sol Latido album is a big strummy sing-along jam that went some way to putting Hawkwind on the musical map for me. Listening back, I think you can almost pinpoint the exact time that I caught Hawkwind fever. And then bleeds into Space is Deep. Which is a fantastic track. I'm a big fan of this one. This for me is the answer to the question that we posed last episode in how are they going to get the effects that they use into a track to feel ownable. And here the mixing of the acoustic guitar with the FX is just perfect. I feel like harmonically they just work off each other. There's just so much going on. I get lost in the first couple of minutes of this track. I think it's the best Hawkwind singing I've heard yet. I obviously wasn't around when this first came out, but I listen to this and I feel like this is how my generation felt when Oasis came out. You know, there's that feeling of accessibility in the singing because it's not so well done but it's done well enough that you enjoy it but it feels like you want to join in like I'm not a singer at all but I've definitely kind of mouthed this while I've walked my dog around (laughs) around New York and um, a couple of weeks ago when I was listening to this there was still snow on the ground and it was like really dark probably like like 11 p.m not a soul in sight just me and my dog just listening to this track and it just felt so atmospheric it was really nice there's some real like just wave your fist around especially again when they keep a note but then they they go up and that just makes you want to join in you know, that's the inclusive bit which again i think they did really well with silver machine but this just feels a little bit more like they brought it closer you feel like you could be sat down in front of whoever's singing it it's just it's very very inclusive even if it's also the lyrical content is quite critical of the human condition in a fun way 
which they tend to be i've got to say it makes me very happy that you're into this track so much because this is one of my all-time favorite hawkwind tracks and was from the one of the first couple of times i would have heard it it really sank in i had a cd called stasis which was a compilation of all their music on the united artists label it's about the first five albums or so i think and I used to play this over and over and over, and I still love Space is Deep. As you say, it is one of those that you walk along uh, kind of singing to. And Dave's voice is just brilliant on this track. And it's funny listening to the, the albums in order, actually hearing how Dave's voice is becoming like more assured and more confident. As you say, not technically like a, like a singer, but as a vocalist, having uh, having some real character uh, in his voice singing this kind of thing it is beautiful and then it drops into a little jam at the end which is really nice as well so i feel like it's if it just stopped there it may have been fine but i wanted to know where it could go and it does drop into a little hawkwind jam which is which is really nice i don't know how to describe the bass tone um i will talk about it in another track where i feel like it's a bit misplaced but in this one it sounds almost like a bit funk based just because it's not a deep note. It's actually, I want to call it like a rounded note. It kind of has a boink to it. It's got a, this, this feeling of, of a very obvious note where bass can obviously be a lot more subdued and droney. You feel like you're, you're hearing the notes very obviously. But I like that because it means that Lemmy has a chance to get involved and we have this nice breakdown before we have a track that we can actually enjoy the full band getting in on. Yeah, absolutely. It goes without saying everybody loves Lemmy's bass playing, but it really does come through that Lemmy isn't just laying down the bottom end. He's playing all around the melody, uh, basically, that the rest of the band are laying down. And, you know, as he says himself, he came on board thinking he was going to be playing rhythm guitar. He was a rhythm guitarist. And that totally does have a massive influence on how he then plays the bass. Uh, from then on he describes himself as playing more like low-end guitar than playing bass but it really brings character to the tunes hall of the mountain grill is my first hawkwind album and while i was secretly hoping that the psychedelic warlords disappear in smoke would take top spot it had to settle for second place this time instead matt gravitated towards the galactic vibes of d rider and all its space opera goodness They might be about to get a little shuffly with the Nick Turner track on the album, D Rider. Which is a track which I really like. This track is like, when it when it comes on after Winds of Change, it's a nice track to come on afterwards, because again, the kind of windy, windy, whooshy thing trailing off at the end of Winds of Change, and then this coming in is a great little audio segue. Again, I like the little like the, the choppy guitar. The bass sounds great. I know before, um, I think an album or two ago, I was saying that I felt like just the tone of the bass was wrong. The bass in this sounds like bass, but again, not like a big growly subby bass or anything. It's still there as a note, but it just sounds. It sounds like it works for some reason. Maybe it's just because the audio quality is different now. But the extra low end guitar in here plays notes which are super complimentary you can hear them like working in between each other which is really nice it's just again it's got the got a lovely groove to it when it first starts the vocals for me are something else they're so oddly angelic -y, kind of they're they're higher than normal i really like the sound of them actually i, I do think that think they're great um they, they have a little bit of that drama sound from the like the seven by seven and like the, the sonic attack kind of the way that that um that guy reads the reads the prose it has a bit of this in it because it goes up and down several octaves and it has like little turns of phrases which are which are really nice it sounds for me like a war of the worlds track or something yeah, yeah. you know it has this yeah. strange like production to it where it doesn't sound as as raw as Hawkwind normally does and maybe that's something that they've lost a little bit in their their sound transition where it almost sounds a bit too produced sometimes with this like because the first track is is more like them being them yeah then you have wind of change and then this is kind of like what happens if you squidge the two a little bit and you put a little <laughs> bit of that production into a Hawkwind song it's interesting how nick as you say doing the vocals how dramatically different this is from the other big Nick vocal that we've heard before, which of course is Brainstorm, which had the punk, the aggressive, the Johnny Rotten vibe to it. It kind of really does show that the guy's got some range. 
massively. And the lyrical content I really like as well, like the choruses are great. I love spacing out by spacing in, turning up by burning out, lifting off and gazing in. Yeah, I, I like the, the interplay between that. Conceptually, I like this song. I feel like it's got a nice idea to it. So I vibe with not only the way it's delivered. I love spacing out by spacing in. Just for me, I would swap Hall of the Mountain Grill out and put that on an album title <laughs> and just like bang, sold. I think the way that the chorus is delivered has a little bit too much phase effect on it. It took a while for me to realise that's what they were saying. But when, when I figured that's what they were doing, I was like, oh, I really like that. But yeah, that, that phase is a little much, but it is nice as a way of going into something more interesting for the chorus. So I like the idea, even if the execution is just a little bit, maybe up to 11 when they could have backed it off a touch. But again, the, the orchestral feeling is in this track. You know, there is that behind them, there are, there are these very stringy, yeah. choiry kind of sounds, which again, just help glue the whole track together. Absolutely agree. And it's for me, it's like there are two big musical statements on side one of this album. And this is the second one with Psychedelic Warlords being the first one. So yeah, completely with you on that. There is a definite story going through this, which I still haven't quite figured out. They say, for example, the earth was forming from below. So I'm wondering, does that mean, because the first thing they talk about is like, almost like being kids, it's almost like a call back to children of the sun somehow. Like, you know, we were young, we were innocent. When we talk about the earth forming from below, I was wondering if that meant like, as they were exploring from a, a, a low vantage point, it looked like the earth was forming in the same way that, you know, you just see more of it as it, as it comes, or whether or not they're in space and the earth is literally forming. But then they talk about their mother, maybe their mother's also in space, but they also say a dragon told them where to go and also they forge rings. So like suddenly there is fantastical elements, which is the first time I think I've really heard that in a in a Hawkwind track. So the story is there. It's kind of confusing. I'm not quite sure I get it, but the chorus is great. So I'm fine with it. While we didn't dwell on it for too long in our chat, Spiral Galaxy 28948 was, is, and remains a blissful instrumental that felt like a culmination of everything Hawkwind had learned on their journey so far. Which, um, uh, beautiful segue to Spiral Galaxy 28948, which, funny enough, I don't know about you, but even now when I hear this, the introduction to this track leads my brain to think it's going to be a completely different track than the track it turns into. Because you get those big doomy kind of chords at the beginning, and then it goes off into something which is much more foot-tappy and upbeat. Yes, yeah, you're right, actually. I guess I still hear that as the end of Standing at the Edge, uh, okay. rather than maybe the beginning. Because again, there's, there, there's a nice blend there. I don't know why they added 28948. I just like Spiral Galaxy. It just sounds nice to say. It's almost Simon House's birthday, apparently. According to, um, I think it's in Joe Banks' book, he was actually the 29th of the 8th rather than the 28th of the 9th, but 1948. And he wrote it. I'm just going to call it Spiral Galaxy. Fair because play. that sounds more interesting and evocative to me. This, for me, a bit like Golden Void, is just great, unrestrained Hawkwind for me. It's really good. I feel like the title makes it feel like we've gone back to space again, and I just feel like it's just somewhere where Hawkwind is more comfortable in. The fantasy stuff they're doing is fine, music storytelling is fine, but the fact it's called Spiral Galaxy, this just sounds like they've gone a bit more sci-fi again, and it feels like it just gives them permission to just let themselves go a little bit more. Yep, good shout. And I do love the, the energy in this track. It always used to kind of fill me with kind of visions of the 60s just the vibe of the whole thing uh, felt much more 60s and 70s but yeah i mean it, it really does inject some energy into the album after the spoken word piece and is definitely uh, a simon house classic it's weird it's kind of daft and it's definitely a couple of minutes too long but the strange story of Steppenwolf captured our imagination and sent us on a trip to the Magic Theatre with the serene strings of Simon House guiding us into our collective hallucination. This track has been an event during the, the time I've been listening. The first time I heard it, I was like, oh, Hawkwind found a Santana record somewhere. 
and just went, yeah, we'll do that for a bit. It's strange because it sounds so that kind of vibe, which again is, is something I haven't really heard them do before. But they do it really well. I feel like this has a real infectious groove considering the subject matter. I feel like it's delivered in a really strong, groovy way. And I'm assuming this is Calvert again. Yeah, this is. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's written by Calvert and Brock, but all of the words, everything's going to be Calvert. So this for me is when Calvert really shines. I think the the delivery again is borderline ridiculous, but also makes me love the track in the same way that I feel like when Calvert does it right, he can really get involved in a way which is actually very, um, very becoming. I think that the rhyming on the tracks is amazing. There's this lovely kind of lilting staccato to it. There's some really lovely like imagery of this. This um, the idea of walking past a pool of liquid sky sounds amazing. I can imagine that idea of just being like, it's basically like a puddle, I'm assuming, because when you look into a puddle in a particular type of light, you can see the sky reflected in it. But even just calling it that sounds really nice. The rhymes are good. The idea of electrically static fur that can sense things from miles around, all that kind of stuff. It feels, again, very visceral, which I feel like that Eleven Fingers thing has. It has this kind of feeling of, of viscerality, which I can really just understand and empathize with and relate to. The story's fun, obviously very weird, but it's very easy to get caught up in it. There's a bit which I think is hilarious after the uh, the second part of the track, like after the breakdown, there's a whole couple of lines which says he finds a, a sign on a wall or a, or a door. The line is, the sign said to the magic theatre, it is not for everyone. It is but for madmen only. The first performance has begun. And that sounds really cool, but I was thinking, who put that sign up? Why do you put a sign up after <laughs> the performance has started? Why do you not put a sign up saying to the Magic Theatre, like, hurry up? There's a lot to put on a sign. And it's those kind of things which just always make me feel like, what is this city we're in that people are putting signs up for things already in progress? That took a long time for me to try and unpack, and I still don't think I'm over it. But the whole world is fantastic, and musically, it's just great. Like, Hawkwind are the masters now of the long breakdown. You know, before they used to do breakdowns, and then they did what I used to call, like, the uh, the instrument babble, and it was a bit kind of a bit muddy and a bit hard to really appreciate. I feel like in the last two recordings, they've got these just absolutely down pat. The sax breakdown after the chorus is always really nice, the way it just kind of comes in and helps accentuate the chorus. In the breakdown, when the violin comes in, that always gets me. Whenever I hear it, I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. It's really evocative. It just cuts through, just has this wistfulness to it, which um, Hawkwind is so good at creating. It's so atmospheric. A little bit like the um, previous track, I like this from the breakdown on, like the second part of the track. I really like again it's got some of these really nice staccato things where he says like a freak a fiend a figment of mind has that like it's all ding 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 you know i think it's just enunciated so nicely which just really helps with the whole track but yeah the breakdown into the second part of the whole track i think is really good this might be one of my favorite tracks that hawkwind have done weirdly it's uh whenever it has come on in my listens i've always paid a lot of attention to it and the surprising santana groove strange story calvert on top of his game violin during the breakdown yeah all of that just together is just a great little package that's a pretty good description my own feedback on this really i like this track i wish it were a little bit shorter it goes on for quite a long time for me it, it's one that i'm really enjoying and then i'm slightly weary of it and I remember when I saw it played live and I hadn't played the track for quite a long time so it played live was really into it but then the breakdown went on the whole I am a man wolf I am a wolf man all of that bit and it went on for quite a long time and I thought oh, they've really dragged this out live and then I went and listened to it and it was like oh no <laughs> they haven't this is how long it is that's really my only criticism and usually when I like something it's like no this can go on for as long as it needs to but yeah this could have done with being edited down by a few minutes I think for me but it's a strong track for sure I agree that I think that's why I say from the breakdown on, I really like it. I don't mind it being as long as it is, but I, th I think you're right. It does start to um, maybe outstay its welcome a touch, not to the point where I take too many points off. No, fair play, fair comment. After a quick time jump to 2021 and back again to 1977, we found Hawkwind in a much more combative mood, summarized very effectively by the powerful and poignant Hassan Isabar. We get from this light-hearted behavior into uh, probably, I would say, in terms of subject matter, one of the heaviest songs that Hawkwind have done because it is very direct. It is very of the time. 
the kind of issues that were going on at the time, it's still going on today, it's very prescient, which is uh, Hassan Isaba. And I'm going to tee this up with a couple of things. Firstly, a beautiful piece here that Joe Banks talks about uh, Hassan Isaba. When he says, the finger bells and quasi-Arabic violin at the start of Hassan Isaba may be blatant exoticism, but they conjure images of Bedouin tents and veiled harems nonetheless. There's some teasing foreshadowing of the song's main theme, some villainous organ, and then its big Eastern-flavoured riff crashes in. Calvert chants frenziedly over the top, conflating an ancient Islamic warrior creed with the present-day Middle East of oil feeds, petrodollars, and Black September. His analysis isn't exactly nuanced, but it's a potent reminder of 70s headlines about the oil crisis, the Yom Kippur War, Palestinian terrorism, and endless plane hijackings, all of which retain a queasy prescience today. Now, Black September is referred to there, and uh, anybody who wasn't news aware in the 70s might not know what this term is. Matt uh, particularly wasn't aware. I was obviously far too young to be aware of this. So for anyone who doesn't know, Black September is also known as the Jordanian Civil War, which was a conflict fought in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan between the Jordan Armed Forces and the Palestine Liberation Organization in 1970. It is also the name adopted by a militant Palestinian organization, uh, which was founded around the same time. And if anybody knows the story of the Munich massacre, where the Israeli athletes and the West German policemen who were killed during the 1972 Summer Olympics, they were carried out by Black September. So it's just kind of worth knowing why Calvert shouts Black September through this track. He doesn't explain it or expand on it at all. He just shouts Black September, but that's why. So that takes us into Hassan E. Saba. And Matt, how did you come to this? Removing context for a second, sonically, I think this track is really my kind of track. It's the first time we've felt this vibe since we heard Magnu, I feel like. You know, Magnu had some of that Eastern desert rock kind of stuff before. This is that even more so. And as uh, as your quote said, that idea of the kind of, I called it xylophone, but yeah, finger bells, that, that kind of thing, like, it immediately adds a sense of sinister theatricality to the track, which, like you said, instantly evokes feelings of, of deserts and of like, for me, it's night skies with twinkling lights and that idea of um, people like moving through endless wastelands and, and that kind of thing. I like the instruments used to make this. I like the lilt and the sway of the tracks. I do find that kind of sound really great. There's a reason why Desert Rock is something we bonded over. There's, you know, that idea of the minor keys, the kind of like ending on these kind of like drawn, more sinister feeling notes. For me, this has proto tool, porcupine tree, opeth, that kind of feeling that we've talked about before. I can really feel the influence of, of this kind of thing on more contemporary acts. Also, the mystical intro with the finger bells and the uh, and the fiddle and everything, the transition to the guitar is really nice. We set the tone and now we're going to bring in our rock part. It's really nice. It's really effective. You know, like there's an instant kind of head nod to it. Even if like the subject matter is still kind of like very heavy, the, the music itself carries itself, you know, really nicely. If this was just an instrumental, I think it would still be really good. You know, and I think that's a, a tribute to the track. The way things are delivered feels very like the original Hawkwind stuff. Again, I'm going to say you shouldn't do that again, but that feeling of like the chanting, the rhythmic repetition of all this has that very kind of classic, well-rehearsed Hawkwind uh, feel to it. I love the echo on the snare drum. It just adds this pounding rhythm to the whole piece that just has this feeling of like moving forward, that bang, which just has this tail to it. Yeah, solid riff, roaring drums, well-sung, rhythmic chanting. I feel like the only thing it's missing to somehow make it like a full Hawkwind track is having any kind of synth influence on it at all. But this is completely synth removed, which is rare now for Hawkwind. So uh, to have this feeling very rocky, maybe feels a bit more punk because I feel like most punk records are normally like someone shouting, someone with a guitar, someone with half a drum kit and you're done. They didn't have the budget normally to be able to get and plug and balance a synthesizer. In terms of the content, I didn't know who Asane Sabah was. I had to uh, Google that 
to find out he was a you know mystical assassin from a long time ago. Given the fact that the Afghan war is just quote unquote ended, even though it you know <laughs> kind of hasn't, it's just entered stage three. Um, you know, like this is an interesting time to be listening to this, just because of that idea of like talking about infidels, talking about oil, talking about the Western pillage of the Arab countries. Yeah, it's, it's much more poignant now. I guess like a Western band being critical, therefore, of the West. Um, I can imagine that was pretty controversial then in the same way it's kind of controversial now. Listening to this now, we've kind of gone through that kind of like, you know, there was a kind of like a 90s, early 2000s thing where like all the films had Arabian terrorists, but then like the New York Times articles comes out, the documentaries come out, you know, people like chill out for a second. 9-11 was a long time ago. People realized that that was much more complex than anyone thought. It wasn't just like, yeah, we're going to attack this country for no reason. You know, everyone has a lot more information. So like people are a lot more critical of it. So to listen to this now, it feels more like Hawkwind were on the right side of history. Yeah, very much so. Um, it doesn't really expound on the concepts that he's putting forward in the track. It's just kind of obvious from the music. This is one of those cases where the music does the job of expanding on the lyrics. You know what the feeling is because this is what the music does. It's interesting also earlier you referenced Adrian Shaw's bass as, as kind of giving you thoughts of Lemmy. Because this, I think, is the most bass-driven track that Hawkwind have done for many albums. The massive burst jolt of adrenaline that you get when this first kicks in, but then in particular when it kicks back in at the end after the breakdown in the middle, is all to do with that rolling bass. And for that reason, I think it's a it's a huge live track, as you can imagine. In fact, you remembered a little bit from vague memories of it being played at one of the gigs that you went to. It's still a huge live track. Incredibly, they went through a phase in the 80s of introducing this track as Assassins of Allah, which again is something I'm not sure you would do today. But a uh, absolutely brilliant track with another fantastic piece of Simon House violin. It's incredible to think of a song that's as kind of as aggressive and driven as this. Yeah, this is definitely one of the standout pieces, not just of this album, but of, of Hawkwind in general, I think. We morphed into Binge Lords for 25 years on, and Matt selected The Lonely Ones, a track that united us in an appreciation of beautiful arrangements, poetic vision, and vocals that could be described as decidedly Bowie-esque. I've always been quite glad that this was the first track on side two because it kind of gets it nicely out of the way and leads us to the only ones. Which is definitely Hawkwind making up for the last two tracks in spectacular fashion. This might be one of the best tracks that Hawkwind have done, in my opinion, thus far. Wow. Yeah, I think it's gorgeous. The intro is instantly compelling. It's got that guitar strum. I personally really like guitar strumming just because I didn't really grow up with stringed instruments as a as something that I really like understood. I was much more of a keyboardist, a synth guy, that kind of thing. So when I can hear the strum, it helps me connect with the instrument more. Then the lyrics are delivered with this kind of grandioseness. And actually, I'm going to bring something up here that the delivery of this, again, stylistically compared to Psypower, compared to Freefall, compared to 25 years, this is done in a very different way. And this I also heard when we did the Somnia review, and I mentioned that I thought that Hawkwind sounded a bit Bowie-like. And I know that Joe Banks kind of called me out on that and said that he had never heard that. But if you listen to Icarus Flu, for me, the way that they say it, they put this lilt on the I in Icarus and even flu, they kind of pronounce flu, F-L-O-O-O-O-O-E-W. It's kind of flu. And for me, that just sounds the way that Bowie sings on like Let's Dance, for example. I feel like he takes words and he elongates them and twists them. And to hear them all singing at the same time and all putting that on, that is for me very reminiscent of listening to Bowie. So I don't know if Joe ever listens to this or if anyone who listened to that agreed or disagreed with me. That's what I am saying. This is the Hawkwing grandioseness being pulled out to full effect and just for me being very reminiscent of, of that kind of thing. So I just wanted to get that out there because it's the first thing you really listen to. But the way that they deliver the first four lyrics of the verse before they go into the first chorus, those four lines are just fantastic. An entire thought just absolutely compressed into four glorious lines that talk about myth, tragedy, loss, 
hope, future generations, inspiration, all of that just crunched down into four lines that then resolve into the chorus. And that chorus is just sublime. Hawkwind are singing in a way which doesn't feel like forced or ironic or a bit self-conscious. This is just pure expressive singing. And again, lots of them all together working in such beautiful lockstep with the music with synths just adding little like trills over the top of it when they hit free with the rest of the music just carrying on under all of it for me that's just light as in the air i want to sing along sounds fantastic yeah it's a beautiful track for sure and you're right that first verse is reminiscent to me of the uh, the clone poem in um spirit of the age the spirit of the age that's the one not in terms of its content but in terms of it being you can't imagine any other words being used in that. If you wrote that, you'd just stare at it for a long time. And then the chorus is again, it, it like Psy Power for me. The chorus is really catchy, has a great hook. You know, you'd feel the need to be singing it as you're walking along the road with it in your headphones. It's one of those. Such a departure, really, for them to do that kind of thing. And again, I suspect that the people in ARC who are now part of this lineup are just probably better at backing vocals than we've seen before. Maybe that's something to do with it. But yeah, it's a great change in pace. And it really just heralds a run of tracks here, which feel like they really gel and work together as like a unit. The idea of it being a concept album really works for me across the last three tracks of which this is the first one. Just out of interest, do you get what I mean when I'm talking about the way that these lyrics are being delivered, whether or not you think they're bowish or not? Yeah, I I hadn't thought of that in the years that I've heard it, but that's probably because you hear it and then you settle into your way of listening to it. But when you bring these things up with your fresh way of listening to it, and then I listen to it again, I hear in it what you've picked up. It's almost over 20, 25, 30 year period you can become immune to hearing new things in some of the tracks. You're almost hearing what you've always heard rather than hearing what's actually being played. When you open your mind a little bit to some of these things, when somebody says, oh, did you pick this up or do you pick that up? It just brings a new kind of life to the track to me. And certainly I go back and listen to sometimes these albums following hearing your kind of thoughts on it. And I do hear them in a, in a slightly new way, which is, you know, is, is oftentimes really cool. So I get where you're coming from. I wouldn't have come up with it myself simply because it's my habit is of hearing it a different way. But now you say it, it's like, yeah, I can totally see that in it for sure. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see if anyone else thinks the same differently or others. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know from anyone whether they experienced some of the tracks in a different way like I do when we've heard what Matt brings to it from having heard it only for the first time what like three weeks ago or something rounding this track off I do like the second verse as well that the first one is you know taking the Icarus myth I like the idea of the wax wings dripping and then making it like a wax seal as this roadmap to exploration that that someone else will pick up and take and they kind of liken that then I think to our own space race you know, they, they talk about chariots of fury and flame for us. And I feel like that's got to be talking about the crazy amount of energy needed to launch a rocket into space. We do rise on flame in order to, to get out there. We talk about, you know, our hopes in different skies, like Icarus are looking to the skies to see what's up there. So I feel like there's both a call to adventure and a warning at the same time. They call the adventurers today these lonely pioneers, but they are the only ones that are free, a bit like freefall. They are in the sky, you know, they're, they're in this place where things can't get them in the same way and they're, they're dealing with a whole new set of problems and they have picked up this call of history, but also maybe warning them that they shouldn't reach too far lest they fall like Icarus himself. This for me is the, is the good dissonance that I like from Hawkwind when they have this idea of like, we're going to praise you for doing it, but also we're going to be worried about you for doing it. And that has this nice shamanistic feeling somehow of like both the adventure and the the danger because you know adventure is dangerous adventure is is unknown and as we've seen it is like even getting to space is is violent and energetic and crazy and difficult and then even when you're there that's only the start of your worries so yeah i i, I do like the, the parity here between the idea of the the myth and then what is actually happening during the time in 78 when this album drops and also just finally violin cameo at the end if i wasn't going to like this track enough just at the end it's like uh, oh yeah you know that thing you like 
here's a little bit of it for you. Just take that and go. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Yep, Mr. House, back in for a cameo. Always welcome. As the 70s drew to an end, so did our season. But there was just enough time to thoroughly depress ourselves with the mighty high rise, a scorching commentary on the dehumanization of city dwellers from an uncaring municipality that drew the 70s to a bittersweet close. So talk of bleakness takes us to high rise, probably the emotional high point or down point, I guess, of the album. And unusual for Hawkwind, but a, a, an amazing track. And Joe Banks, we haven't referred to either of our two usual authors yet, but I'm about to do that now. Joe Banks actually says something pretty beautiful about High Rise. We know that it's based on J.G. Ballard book of the same name. And Joe writes, the title nods to Ballard, but the words are inspired by Calvert's experience of living in a Margate tower block his depiction of boredom fueled vandalism amid brutalist architecture could have come from a contemporary Sunday supplement where high-rise estates were routinely condemned as spirit-sapping slums in the skies. For Calvert, they're the epitome of a dehumanised future where dignity is sacrificed to the cold bureaucracy of central planning. High-rise is full of melodic pathos and its chorus delivers a genuine emotional punch Harmony backing vocals bristling with Calvert's caged up rage. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, um, beautifully put. And actually, probably not since Space is Deep have I had such an instantly emotional reaction to a Hawkwind track at time of listening. The first time I listened to PXR5, I took it to the gym and uh, I was on a treadmill. And when High Rise came on, I actually had to stop the treadmill and just listen to this track. It grabs you by the heartstrings from the first note and doesn't let you go until way after that song has finished. It's really good as a as both an idea and how it is delivered. It feels somehow to me like this is Hawkwind's Comfortably Numb, if you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. And you actually said this to me and I'd already thought of that myself only a couple of weeks earlier when listening to it. It's the dominance musically of like a chord sequence rather than a melody or a tune. Largely, I think, the chord sequence that that organ is playing. And you get after the first chorus is finished, that little instrumental piece where the vocals drop out, and you get that really overdriven organ playing that chord sequence. It's really powerful, which is the similarity between the two tracks, I think. I also think the way that the bass sounds, it's very thick and round and plods along, but the notes it makes are very poignant as well. So I feel like that also works in a kind of Floydian way. And I know that they worked with the producer of Floyd before. I know that that was Curb Crawler, which wasn't really the same. But yeah, when I first heard this track, I thought this sounds like it is going for the emotional. Yeah, absolutely true. Uh, Dave Gilmore himself from Floyd produced curb crawler and we discussed on astounding sounds how you know how alan powell and that were trying to evoke a a freudian sound it definitely has that to it and you're right about the bass Uh, adrian shaw is phenomenal on this track it really does carry it along beautifully and the delivery from calvert there are certain lines in this that just give me chills when he talks about tearing out telephones and rip out the pages of directories and wreck all these love that line and then later on there's the tentacles of human gore splattered on the pavement from the 99th floor the way he delivers those lines are just absolute bite in them yeah and i think the delivery in this is as important as the content of the lyrics like we've heard before some of the ways where things have been delivered previously are vital to the ways you hear them and this one it's done in a very subtle way but there's emotion cracking through that it does sound like the delivery of someone who is genuinely upset at the situation again it it has a slight resignation to it again where there's not much that can be done this is what it is and someone is just recounting the reality it's not angry it's disappointed which you know feels feels even worse and i feel like that sense of disappointment is always very well carried by a slightly overdriven organ sounding synthesizer which is almost kind of cheating emotionally sometimes because it's very easy to just lean on that and then have that really just like you know get you 
I'm not saying it's cheating because it's it's effectively done, but you don't want to do it all the time. You want to do it when it when it matters. And again, counterpointing that fractured, overdriven, distorted drone with a uh, like a, a ponderous, melancholic baseline does that lovely counterpoint of just somehow just like again when when all the notes change at the same time. Every time that happens, it just feels like another little stake in your heart in terms of how this, how this is affecting you. It's almost shocking, this track, because of all the brilliant things Hawkwin do, delivering a massive slab of emotion and pathos and poignancy, that's not usual for a Hawkwind album. That's not what you expect from Hawkwind, which I think kind of trebles the impact of this when it hits you. It's strangely poignant from an emotional point of view f for me, because when I've been listening to this track on repeat, doing a lot of dog walking, I'm surrounded by these, you know, I'm in the city of high rises. So it becomes this interesting way of looking at the city for like the four minutes this is on and it very much changes your feeling from this idea of this amazing New York skyline to actually these towering potential suicide machines. And actually even just thinking about things like the Empire State has 12 feet high wrought iron fences around it to stop it becoming a suicide machine. And also it always makes me think of Grenfell, obviously back in the UK and um, the fire that happened there. Yes, absolutely. If they are built by uncaring people and maintained by uncaring people who, who just see their buildings as contents and not homes, then they do become, if not suicide machines for Grenfell, murder machines. And that is a terrible thing. We've said before, there's been ideas around this, almost like the idea of like, if you see a person as a robot, you treat them differently. You don't see them as a human. And I think that has been a theme that Hawkwind have used before. And I think is a, is a fairly poignant thing that they use to talk about the loss of humanity when you don't treat people as humans and you do treat them as, a, 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 as numbers or collateral or as strangers even you dehumanize them and in so doing, you treat them differently. The idea of a high rise, no one who's built a high rise or thought of a high rise has ever lived in one. It's a solution to a problem which was kind of thought about by a psychopath who never thought about the lasting problems that making these things would cause because no one really wants to be in one of these things. I have friends in New York who live in much more luxurious versions of these things now. So, you know, they don't mind. But the idea of a tower block in like East London or something is not seen as a luxury thing. And it does perpetuate this feeling where if you treat people like animals, they do kind of devolve a bit. And uh, like you said, that idea of um, someone Someone who is smashing up a phone. I've never even really thought of the idea of why someone would do that. Or I have, but I've had it dismissed to me from people who are much more like, oh, you know, they're, they're thugs, they were going to do that anyway. But actually, I do like the way this is spilled out where actually it's an act, the only act of rebellion you have against the situation you find yourself in. And it's funny that they actually finished that be a rebel without a cause, because I think, no, you do have a cause. This is justified. This is a righteous fury that you have. The only thing you can take it out on is the thing that someone who owns the building also owns. And yeah, fine, there's the other way of looking at it, that yes, you're destroying it for everyone else, but also you feel like you put me in this situation and this is how I act. And I'm glad that you said that actually this is said from experience because I didn't I didn't know that. Again, in the same way that we supposed that Freefall was about someone actually skydiving, I supposed that you could look at these and make all this up or read that book and talk about it. But the fact it is actually Calvert's real life experience does add that extra bit of grit and relatability to this. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I thought when I saw that this was based on J.G. Ballard, obviously he's a magnificent writer, but I remember even in the 1980s, there were discussions about estates and tower blocks and the crushing effects that these things have on people. So it was clear to me that it was based on more than, you know, just I'm going to write this great song about this book. I wasn't so aware that he'd actually lived it himself, but that just does add to the emotion of the situation. I think with some of Hawkwind's songs where the lyrics are so much kind of at the forefront of the song, the music is really good background for the lyrics. But in this case, I think the music is adding to the lyrics and adding to that emotional punch that the lyrics give, which is slightly different, I think, from what they've done before. Yes. And I think that I don't know this for sure, but I know that you said that some of these were live overdubs and some of them were studios. This sounds like a studio track. And I think this wouldn't have been as good if it had sounded live in the same way that Uncle Sam's on Mars does. 
the breakout between the overdub and the live changes, I think because of the intensity and the swirling, like amalgam of sounds that that, that, that uses to drive its, its foreboding and its intensity. You can almost hear that sound and almost imagine this pyroclastic cloud of dust from a apocalyptic storm coming towards you where this is actually much more pared back. It's almost funereal in the way that it talks. You know, the fact it's so slow and so plodding, but again, so deliberate. Even the high rise chorus sounds like it's some kind of like eulogy for this like this idea like they're using its name but they're doing it again as a kind of lament that we've heard before yep i agree i think this actually is live but it's almost certainly had an awful lot more done to it the only one i think that the only track which is the five of them together in the studio making a studio track is jack of shadows i think everything else is either dave kind of off doing his thing or them overdubbing live tracks but i agree that this one has had the most work done to it a beautiful track an emotional uh, high point i think of the hawkwind catalog to date even uh, dave's guitar solo which you don't necessarily need but i really like dave's guitar solo in this it really adds to the music rather than just being we need a guitar solo here please yeah, I think what it does is it, it gives you the increased suspense before we get to the inevitable of the death. We've been talking about a suicide machine. We've been describing these boxes as just like, you know, containment facilities. And then there's the break. Because you know it's coming, it just prolongs it in this horrible agony that it is before, you know, you hit this release and we talk about the suicide from the 99th floor. I know what you said there about the, um, well, someone said he jumped, but we know he was pushed. I think that's one of my favorite lines of the whole thing, because when you think about it, he was pushed by the environment. And that reminded me a bit of, um, you know, Gormenghast. Yep, Titus Grown. Yeah, that book is a fantastic book because the castle is almost a main character and is described like that. And, you know, like the, the way that the castle is designed, the rooms that it has, even its decoration impacts people's memories and impacts their emotions and changes their behavior. And I felt like there was almost a Gormenghast feel to the end of this about like, if it is a suicide machine, then eventually it's going to win. A bit like Death Trap in a way that like, you know, this might be an inevitability. And I think that even as we said, before about the idea of dehumanizing the fact that the person who lands is described twice as a kind of subterranean animal adds to that idea that all humanity was lost before he'd even jumped when he hit the ground he looks like a starfish then you have tentacles all of those things are very non-human and so I think it's very graphic to get the idea of the starfish. There's a, an almost beautiful way of describing what it would be like to have your body hit tarmac from that high up. And again, makes you think about it. But again, describing it as a starfish, describing tentacles for me makes you feel like these people aren't human in the eyes of the people who are looking at this mess. So I think that even then that idea is just carried through from beginning to end with this absolute certainty, which means, like I said, that like this grabs you from the very beginning and doesn't ever really let you go. In fact, I could have stood for them to have thought of another verse for this, you know, in order to just make it a little bit longer. Because I do think that compared to like some of the tracks that we really like, the Hawkwind have, this is like a fraction of the size and yet it's walnut tight. So, you know, I think it's nice as it is, but if it was a little bit more, then maybe that would have been interesting just to see where else we might have gone with it. I also was thinking about um, if ever there was a track that someone should cover like now, either this or Uncle Sam's on Mars would be an amazing thing to have like an up-to-date version because these things sound great, but they sound very of the time. And the idea of updating them to show what has changed would be interesting, you know, it would be, would be put maybe like a nice point in its, in its own right. That's very true. It, it uh, definitely comes to mind when these, these words of, uh, of Robert Calvert seem as relevant now as they ever did. So that was our journey through the 1970s with Hawkwind, and those were the tracks that Matt selected for the Hawk Binge Master Playlist. If this is your first episode with us, well, there's a lot more where that came from. And if you've been with us for the journey so far, then we thank you and we'll be rewarding your patience with episode one of season two very shortly. And we shall see how that master playlist develops through the 1980s. Rub your eyes. This is no dream. <laughs>